Good morning and welcome to Rye Hill Baptist Church for Sunday morning, September 25th, 2016. This morning's message brought to us by Senior Pastor Michael Franklin and is part of the survey of the New Testament series is entitled, Do the Right Thing. If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Philemon. The book of Philemon. We are going through the New Testament. Uh, you know, we did Titus, I guess it was three weeks ago now. Uh, and really the two books in the New Testament that people know very little about is Titus and Philemon. And uh, we want to uh, look at our outline if you have a bulletin and want to go along with us. I want to preach a message today called Do the Right Thing. Do the right thing. Let me go ahead and give you the outline. Number one, Paul's greeting. Paul's greeting. He always had uh, special greetings in his epistles. Number two, Paul's appeal. He was appealing to his friend Philemon. And number three, Paul's request. He had a special uh, request also. Uh, So with that in mind, let me give you a little history, a background about the book of Philemon. The Apostle Paul wrote, the book of Philemon. And we know it is the smallest epistle. It is just one chapter in 22 verses. I can honestly say when the sermon's over, I preached a whole book today. All right? So I'm excited about that. It was a personal letter written to Philemon. And uh, we know historically Philemon lived in Colossae. There is some interpretation. And like I said, folks, uh, commentaries are commentaries. They're not always uh, exact uh, history and beliefs and opinions go. There are some that believe Paul was never in Colossae, uh, which I personally don't believe uh, because of his relationship with Philemon, and I'll share that with you later. It is a story about a slave owner and one of his runaway slaves, Philemon is. Paul's writing on behalf of Onesimus, who was a deserter and a thief. Onesimus had stolen some money from Philemon, his owner, and ran away. He ended up in Rome as a fugitive, hiding from the law. By the providence of God, Onesimus ended up hearing Paul preach the gospel, and he was saved. Since Onesimus was now a Christian, Paul encouraged him to go back to Philemon and do the right thing. Paul's letter to Philemon explains what had happened. Paul asked Philemon to receive Onesimus back with love and forgiveness. Paul demonstrates how it, how important it is to love and support new Christians. Paul puts his money where his mouth is by promising Philemon that he would make things right on any money Onesimus owed him. Philemon is a very small book and not really well known, but it is a powerful story with life, life applications jumping off the pages in this wonderful epistle. So let's look at do the right thing in Philemon verse 1. Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother. And again, he uses the phrase prisoner of Christ many times in his epistles. And that's a two-sided coin there. First, he was literally a prisoner in Rome when when he wrote the book of Philemon, but also he was a prisoner of Christ, literally. If you remember who he was, he was Saul. He was a a Christian persecutor, all right? He was on his way to Damascus to arrest Christians. And on the way, a bright light came and blinded Saul. And Saul, for three days, could not see anyone. And he sent him to a man named Ananias. And Ananias told him how to be saved, and he was saved. And from that point on, he was a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Not that he couldn't walk away, it was just that, you know, uh, Christ owned him. Christ, you know, everything he did was about Christ. He wrote almost half of the New Testament. And that's why he uses this phrase, a prisoner of Christ. Second part of verse 1, to Philemon our beloved friend and fellow laborer. And he used the word, he didn't say just friend. He used the word beloved friend. And this is why I believe Paul sometime 
had went to Colossae. And I also believe that Philemon went to Rome sometime to visit Paul. You can see as we walk down through these verses, the relationship Paul had with Philemon. It wasn't just a casual acquaintance. All right, As you can see, uh, through his writing and the words that he used in greeting Philemon, it was a personal and, and, and close relationship. Verse 2, to the beloved Aphia, which was Philemon's wife, and I believe Archippus was his son, our fellow soldier. And when they say soldier, they're not talking about Roman army. Uh, I believe they're talking about a soldier in the Lord's army. To the church in your house. You have to realize, in those days, especially in the first century, they did not have church buildings as we see them. Can you imagine the problems after the day of Pentecost, when 3,000 people got saved? How would you like an invitation that long and 3,000 people get saved? Folks, where would we put them? There would be no way we could put them in this building. But it was a wonderful, wonderful thing. And they would uh, somehow uh, divvy those folks up and they had... Many house churches back then. It was very, very commonplace. Now look at verse 3. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Most of the epistles starts out in some form of verse 3. Grace and peace. And folks, the reason Paul was giving grace was because he received grace from the Lord Jesus Christ. And folks, we all need peace. You think about our world. You think about how messed up our world is. You think about the riots and the racial tension and all that is going on. And Paul is simply greeting them as brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, to the main part of the greeting. I thank my God, making mention of you always in my prayers. And here's another reason I believe they were close. All right. If they were not close, Paul would not be thinking of Philemon. But you pray for your closest friends, your closest friends. And so I believe they had a close relationship as brothers in Christ. I thank you and mention you. And folks, every word in the Bible is important. It says always, which meant, meant any time Paul prayed, he thought of Philemon. Uh, hearing your love and faith which you have uh, toward the Lord Jesus Christ and towards all the saints. And again, talking about his love, Philemon had love for the Christian brethren. They had church in their home. And they're, you know, to, to do that, folks, uh, there was historical information and, and, and a suggestion that Philemon was fairly well off. And uh, as being fairly well off, he would also have slaves. Now, folks, the issue today, I'm not going into the issue of slaves. We know slavery is wrong. We know slavery was abolished. I understand in third world countries it goes on. All right, but that is not the issue there. It was very common in that day. Matter of fact, one time I read in the Roman Empire there were over 60 million slaves. All right, so it was something that was common in that day, and folks that owned slaves were usually had money, is what I'm trying to tell you. But that money did not change Philemon. Why? Because of verse 5. Hearing your love and faith towards the Lord Jesus Christ and towards all the saints. What was Philemon? He was a church leader. He wasn't the pastor in Colossae. All right, Epaphroditus was that. But he was a church leader and he showed love towards the brethren. Verse 6, that the sharing of your faith may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. Paul is saying also the thing I like about Philemon, he shares the gospel with people. Scott shared with me just before church that him and Stan were out at the fair last night at the booth uh, with our association. And I'm telling you, he led two teenagers to the Lord last night at our state fair. And I'm telling you, he's beaming. I'm I'm beaming too, Scott. That is two souls that were taken into the kingdom of God. And we give God the glory and the credit for that. But what Paul is saying is, Philemon, you're doing a lot of things right. You are a church leader. In your home uh, is the church. You are encouraged the brethren in the faith. And you are sharing the gospel. Folks, each one of us, 
that are saved has the responsibility to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with people we come in contact to, with. Verse 7, For we have great joy and consolation in your love, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you, brother. So what is he saying? He just does the greeting of, man, how are you? Man, things are going good. I hear great things that are going on in the church. I want to thank you for your friendship. I want to thank you for your love. And I want to thank you for your example of love. And folks, we all need to be refreshed in the ministry. Folks, that's what a vacation is about. It's getting away and, and resting and being refreshed. But do you know other things that we can do? Folks, I thank God for my Christian friends. I really do. I thank God for my Christian friends. And, and again, there's, there's not one. I'm telling you, everybody here I know, I count you as a friend. I really do. Why? Because I know you pray for me. Because I know you pray for me. When I was gone, I know you were praying, traveling grace on me and Lori. And I know uh, through the week you pray for me. And, and folks, uh, we and Paul and other ministers feel that support from friendship. Matter of fact, the Bible speaks of how important friendship is. Hold your finger there and go to Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 4. It's Psalms, Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Verse 9, Ecclesiastes 4, 9, look what it says. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. And folks, I thank God for all my friends. I have many friends. Uh, I thank God for our staff. We as a staff are close. There are no problems. There's no jealousies. There's nothing in our staff. And I thank God for that. But there's one person I thank God for, and I thank God for Brother Steve Stewart, I tell you, he is my best friend. He really is. And I thank God that when I'm away, folks, I would not have gone the length if I had if Steve Stewart wasn't here. Steve is the best associate pastor I have ever worked with. And I'll tell you, go ahead, go ahead. And, and I'll tell you this, if for some reason which I probably would not do if something happened in my backyard and I had to big a, dig a big ditch back there. And folks, nobody wants to dig a ditch alone. I call up Brother Steve and I say, Brother Steve, friend, would you come over and help me dig this ditch? I promise you he would. I promise you. I know Steve. And he knows I would do the same for him. And folks, I have heard in a lifetime that if you have two close friends in a lifetime, you've done well. And that's what the Bible is saying. Two are better than one because they have good reward for their labor. For if one fall, one will lift them up. But woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him. Folks, I have talked to people, and this breaks my heart, that thinks they have no friend. And folks, I cannot agree with that statement in any way. One is because of a hymn that we sing. Anybody know it? What a friend we have in Jesus. So even if somebody on earth, which I rarely believe, matter of fact, I really don't believe that. To be a friend, you have to be friendly. And folks, we need each other. I need you. And you need me. And that's what it's talking about when we're talking friendship here. He's saying, I don't care. That song, He is there all the time. There's no time in your life when God is not with you. No time. And that's what he's saying. Man, I thank God for Christian friends. Verse 11, again, if two lie down together, they will keep it warm. Or how can one be warm alone? And folks, he's talking about body heat. There are stories of hikers there are stories of people that got lost or there was a snowstorm that blew in. And I am telling you, the only way they survived was to huddle up together either in a tent or, or in a sleeping bag because the body heat kept them alive. Oh, listen, folks, we all have a friend and that friend is Jesus. But not only does God give us Jesus, He gives us human friendship. And I thank God 
for human friendship. Verse 12, the one may be overpowered by another. Two can stand with him. And a three-fourth cord is not quickly broken. I'm thinking if somebody walked in here and for some reason thought, I am going to beat the preacher up. I'm going to say this. Big Mike, stand up for me, will you? Big Mike, stand up. My son, Jonathan, would you stand up? Bobby, would you stand up? Now, if y'all can get through these three guys, you're welcome to it, all right? Thank you very much, all right? And I know I joke, I know I joke about this, but I'm serious, folks. Here's what I believe. I believe if somebody was trying to harm me, people would. People would come to my aid. And folks, you say what you want, people are crazy this day. They're nuts. You know what they told us in the last conference we went to? And folks, I want you to remember this. Do not forget this. If somebody comes in the back and points a gun and yells, everybody get a songbook and throw the songbook at that person. I'm serious. They taught us this, that the guy or the person would be so confused and then our marshals could take care of them and escort them out. All right? Folks, listen to me. A friend could save your life. Okay? So what Paul is saying, Paul is, <laughs> and there was one writer that said, it almost sounded like Paul was buttered him up. And I don't believe that. I believe they were close. And Paul was close to Philemon. And that's what I'm saying, folks. I'm saying Paul is thanking God for Philemon's friendship. Number two, not only the Paul's greeting, but look at Paul's appeal. Look at verse 8. Therefore, though I may be very bold in Christ to command you what is sitting. What is he saying? You know, I could just tell you what to do. I am the Apostle Paul. I am your mentor. Matter of fact, if you see later on, Paul led Philemon to the Lord sometime. And Paul could have used his power and his authority and said, Philemon, here's what you need to do, okay? I'm the boss. All right, I'm in charge. I am the apostle. I am the pastor. I am the missions leader. I am the soul winner. And you need to do this. But the relationship was close. And Paul didn't want to do that according to verse 8. Yet, for love's sake, I'd rather appeal to you. Being such a one as Paul, the age, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. He mentions something there that is important. Three weeks ago I preached uh, from Titus, and I told you one of the things that was important was senior adults in the church. They were very important. It's a very important part of the church. But Paul here is drawing from his wisdom. Uh, history tells us that at this time in Paul's life, he was over 60 years old. And when I say 60 years old, he had probably aged 10 years or more, because, uh, you know, where he looked like 70 because all that he had been through. Look at 1 Corinthians 12 sometimes. He was beaten and left for dead. He was thrown out of cities. He was scourged. The cat of nine tails had been on him five times. All of life experiences had made him closer to God. He spent the last one third of his life in prison. And that's what he's saying. He's saying, Philemon, just, just because of my age, just because of my experience, I'm telling you, you need to do the right thing. It says, uh, verse 10, I appeal to you for my son, Onipotus, whom I have begotten while in my chains. And again, he did not mean literal son. Onipotus uh, was not his son uh, by birth. But you remember, he, he you know, Timothy uh, was a son in the ministry. Titus was a preacher and a son in the ministry. And Onipotus uh, was also a son in the ministry. And that's what he was saying. He was saying, treat him like my son, who once was unprofitable, unprofitable, but now is profitable to you and I. Onesimus, I'm telling you, you know what his name means? Profitable. Profitable. And he was a wanted man. I think I forgot to tell you, did you realize that if a, a, a slave escaped 
and especially if he did, if he stole money and did what he did, there was a wanted poster up for him and there was a bounty on his head. And do you know as a citizen you could have got paid to bring that slave home? And when that slave got home, do you know that the owner had the right to put that person to death? Okay? And he is saying, listen, he's not the same guy. He was not profitable when he ran away. He is not profitable when he stole that money. But he now is profitable because he found Jesus Christ. Verse 12, I am sending him back and you therefore receive him. That is my own heart. He's saying, would you treat this runaway slave as you would treat me? He's not the same person. If anybody was, uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things become new. So that's what he is saying. Paul sent this letter, and by the way, Onesimus was the one that carried the letter. He carried this letter back to Philemon. And when you think of the story as a whole, I was thinking of this last night. Everyone was supposed to do the right thing. Paul was encouraging uh, Philemon through the letter to do the right thing. He was uh, talking to Onesimus, and he told him to do the right thing. And you think about it, when Paul gave him that letter, he could have ran away again. He could have said, man, I don't know if Philemon's going to accept this. He could have hid himself. Folks, Rome was thousands and thousands. It was huge. He could have went any direction he wanted. But Paul was saying, take this letter, you go home and you make it right with your owner. And then also the letter itself is saying, you know what you need to do? Philemon, you need to love and you need to forgive Onesimus. That's what he was saying. Verse 13, whom I wish to keep with me that on your behalf he might minister to me in chains for the gospel. What is he saying? Well, Paul was getting old. One of the things he was having trouble with was seeing Another thing he had trouble with, he got cold. You look in two of the epistles, and he asked for a coat in two of those epistles. And what Paul was telling Philemon was, I'm telling you, he's a good worker now. He's taking care of me. He's loving me. He's doing things for me. Verse 14, but without your consent, I wanted to do nothing that your good deed not, may not be by compulsion, as it were, but voluntarily. He is saying, I don't want to tell you what to do. But I am appealing. I am begging you. I am pleading you. Will you treat Onesimus as my son? For perhaps, verse 15, he departed for a while for this purpose that you might receive him forever. Think about that, folks. A runaway slave who thought he was free. He thought if he'd get in a huge town, nobody would know him. And folks, only God could make this happen. Only God. He was a runaway fugitive. There was a bounty on his head. And as he was walking through the city one day, he was on a corner. And he looked up and he saw this older man in chains. In chains, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. He made his way through that crowd thinking, there's something different about this guy. I'm going to listen to him. And the more he listened, Paul gave a gospel invitation and Onesimus uh, accepted Jesus Christ into his life. Folks, he thought he was freed, but he was in chains. A runaway slave is in chains. And folks, when you think about this, this whole story, and here's what we miss in Philemon. I am telling you, it is a perfect look at salvation. Salvation. Look what he says. He said, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, verse 16, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Well, guess what, folks? We are all Onesimuses. Before we got sla saved, we were a slave to sin. We were lost. We were running from God. We were not looking for God. And I am telling you, God loved us so much that He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to die for our sins. 
And Jesus' blood paid the price. Imputation is the word. It paid for our sin. And now, all we have to do is accept Jesus Christ into our life. And we can be free from sin. Free from guilt. And alive in Jesus Christ. We were destroying ourselves. But yet God intervened. God gave us that invitation. Is that not the perfect illustration of salvation? Folks, I am telling you, God called you to salvation or you would not be saved this day. And that's what Paul is saying here. Paul is saying, listen, he is not the same person. I am appealing to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ as an owner and now as a Christian brother in Christ. Onesimus is not the same. He's coming back a different person. Would you hear him out? Would you listen to my appeal? Hold your finger there and go to Colossians. Just a few pages back, not very far. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. Colossians 3, 12. Therefore, as the elect of God, he's talking about Christians here. Paul is writing to the church at Colossae, holy and beloved, which is what we should be. Put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, and long suffering, which is patience. Paul is telling the Christians in Colossae, put these things on. Be holy, be loving. Have mercy. Why? Because God showed you mercy. Folks, you weren't always following God. You weren't always doing the right thing. And Paul tells him, do the right thing. Tender mercy, kindness, humility, meekness, and long-suffering. Look at verse 13. Bearing one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. What does must do mean? Folks, it's not an option. It's not an option. And I know every time I say this, someone will come up to me and here's what they'll say. But, Brother Mike, you don't know what this person has done to me. Well, I don't. But I know what we did to Jesus. I know that my sin hung Him on the cross. I know that your sin hung Him on the cross. But yet, in the very last minutes of his life, bleeding, bruised, dehydrated, innocent, did nothing but love people, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Folks, the Bible is clear. Here, even as Christ forgave you, you must also do. Look at verse 14. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. Folks, there is only one person, per, perfect person that ever walked the face of this earth, and it was Jesus Christ Himself. And if you want to be like Jesus, you need to love and you need to forgive people. That's what He's saying. Also, look at Philippians 3. Philippians 3. Go with me back just a few more pages. Philippians 3, verse 13. Brethren, I do not count Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. Oh folks, we've got to forget the past. We've got to forget the past. If I'm out anywhere or anybody on Facebook or anywhere uses the word, hey, Taco, what are you doing? You know what that does? That means you knew me uh, before 1980. And do you know what, folks? I was a lost church member. For two years, I didn't even go to church. And when I hear that, what I want to tell them is, I am no longer Taco, folks. All right? My name is Michael D. Franklin, and I am pastor of the Rye Hill Baptist Church. Folks, two things. Number one, you've got to forgive yourself. You've got to forgive yourself. Number two, you've got to forgive others. 
not for their sake, but for your sake. Folks, I've been there. I know it. And you lose. When you don't forgive, you lose as a Christian. And folks, I've heard it, and I've heard this said many, many times. Well, I've forgiven them, but I haven't forgot it. Well, folks, I'll just say this, and there are people that don't agree with this. If you haven't forgot it, then you haven't forgiven it. And again, when I say forgot, that doesn't mean it doesn't come in your head. You know, there are situations that it's hard to release. But what it means, forgiving and forgetting, means I am no longer influenced by this in my life. I'll listen to me, folks. I am telling you, you can be free today. You can be free today. You can let it go today if you will. And that's what he's saying. Look at verse 14. I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Folks, do you realize that you can't change one thing that happened yesterday? You know what we call yesterday? It's called history. It's called history. You can't change one thing. But do you know what? I can change a lot of things from this point now. Okay? From 11, let's see, let's see, 54. From 11.54 on Sunday morning forward, I can change. I can change a lot of things today. I can pick up the phone and tell somebody, you know what? I've been angry and, and I'm sorry. Matter of fact, if you'll get in Matthew chapter 18 around verse 16, it tells you to go to the person one-on-one, just you and that person, and take care of things. And that's what Paul is trying to get to Philemon. He's telling Philemon, listen, I know what he's done to you. I know what he's done. But would you please forgive him? Let's look at the last point. Paul's greeting, Paul's appeal, and Paul's request. Philemon chapter 17. Paul's request. Then if you count me as your partner, receive him as you would me. Friend, partner. And again, most times when you think of partners, we're talking business partners. Folks, I'm telling you, businesses can go bad. I've seen it happen. You need to be right with your business partner. Families. Families can go bad. And a lot of times, folks, it's over money. We should not let money come between blood. He says... Then if you count as me your partner, receive him as you would me. But if he has wronged you or owes you anything, put it on my account. Look what he says. I, Paul, am writing with my own hand. I will repay, not to mention you uh, to you that you owe me even your own self besides. What is Paul saying? Whatever he stole from you, when I come back, I'll pay the bill. Does that not remind you of a parable that Jesus taught? What was the good Samaritan? The good Samaritan said, hey, here's all the money I have. You take care of him till he gets well. And when I come back, I'll pay. And that's what Paul, Paul believed in Onesimus. Paul believed that he was truly converted. Paul wasn't judging him. Paul wasn't saying what he did was right. But he doesn't have a job right now. He doesn't have this. And if there's something here, Paul says, I believe and I mentored him and I believe he got it. And when I get back, when I get back and I can pay you, I will pay you every dime that he owes you. You know what that is, folks? That's putting your money where your mouth is. Anybody can say it. But Paul believed in Onesimus. And Paul, Paul's request was, man, would you just forgive Would you tear that check up? Would you just tear that bill up? And I'll take care of it when I get there. In verse 20, And oh yes, brother, let me have joy from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in the Lord. You know what Paul was saying to his friend Philemon? Would you do it? Not just for me, but would you do it for Onesimus? Would you do it for our Lord and Savior? Would you do it as an example of doing the right thing towards others? Verse 21, having confidence in your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. Oh, folks, Paul is just saying, he's admonishing him. His request is, when he gets there, would you read the letter? When he gets there, would you accept him? When he gets there, would you... 
not put him in the slave quarters, but would you put him in the guest room where you would keep me? Would you feed him? Would you grow him in the Lord? Would you mentor him in the faith? Would you show people around you what forgiveness and love is? That's why people would say, hey, hey Philemon, how can you do that? How can you do that? He stole from you. He ran away from you. He would say, he's not the same person. And folks, that's what God wants us to do. Folks, I am telling you, forgiveness will only come from the heart. Love comes from the heart. And the lesson here is, folks, whether it hurts or not, or or how hard it is, we as Christians need to do the right thing. We need to do the right thing. We need to be the bigger person. We need to learn those words. I was wrong. I'm sorry. Would you forgive me? We need to learn that. And then the overriding lesson. If there is one person here, folks, that don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, if you are enslaved by sin, I'm telling you, you can be free today. You can just accept Jesus Christ in your life. You can ask forgiveness of your sins. And God can set you free. Would you bow your heads? Never head bow, never eye closed. I want to read one more verse. One more verse. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you be also tempted. Folks, we who have been a Christian a long time need to show forgiveness and mercy and love in our hearts. Father, Thank You so much for Your Word. God, Your Word is always right. It is always right. And God, I just pray, first for the Christian, God, I pray that You would just do a work in our lives. God, I pray that we would be quick to love. We would be quick to forgive. We would be quick to make things right. God, I pray first, that we are right with You. Our relationship is right with You. And God, I pray it's right with our families. It's right with our families. And God, I pray that our relationships are right with our fellow man. God, help us to do the right thing. Then Lord, if there's one here, just one that doesn't know You, I pray today would be their day of salvation. God, the world has them. They don't know what peace is. They don't know what everlasting life is. They don't know what faith is. And God, I pray that Your Holy Spirit would just convict them today. God, I pray if somebody needs to follow the Lord in baptism, join the church. God, whatever. God, I pray that Your Holy Spirit would convict them this day. God, this is Your time. This is Your invitation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come?